The next speaker that I would like to introduce is Dr. Jean Kagia. She's one of Kenya's best-known obstetrician gynecologists and has worked in Nairobi for almost 30 years, where she also acts as a trustee for the Kenya Medical Women's Association. She has led private and public initiatives in improving maternal outcomes and last year was awarded by the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society for improving women's health. One of those initiatives has been Kyotas, which are nests or maternal shelter for women, which she hopes to make available in all 47 counties in Kenya. Dr. Kagia is a founder and board member of the Institute of Family Medicine, national coordinator of advanced life support in obstetrics, a member of the technical working group on reproductive health of the Ministry of Health. Dr. Kagia is an advocate of economic empowerment of African women and for excellence in universal maternal health care. She will address the symposium on the subject of improving maternal health care in Kenya and the challenges and strategies for low resource nations. Please join me in a very warm welcome to Dr. Jean Kenya. Good morning. I brought some good climate from Africa, so I hope you are enjoying it. Um, uh, thank you very much for asking me to talk about the maternal challenges of maternal health, challenges and strategies for low-resource nations. I think when you think about maternal health, you don't want just to think of that health of the person, but think about the total person in terms of the woman. If you come to the low resource countries, Kenya being one of them, you find that women are the backboard of the economy. They are the ones who look after the children, they look after the piece of land, they look after everything, including their husbands. And so they are very, very hardworking, and their health is very, very important. We also know that the outcome of maternal health in a country is what indicates the health system kind of a health system that a country has. And if the women's health is not good enough, then you know that the health systems are not working. And uh, when you look at the low resource countries, uh, you, you have to look at what would make that person not have a good outcome. And we talk about the three delays which I'm going to talk about. And these three delays are not just a woman doesn't want to go to the, to the health care services. There are too many factors around her and uh, therefore she doesn't end up there. And yet, in Africa, people have babies so much that unless you are the mother of so-and-so, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have, you're not taken to have been a successful woman. So you want to make sure that this woman attains the highest uh, status in the country by being the mother of so-and-so. And some of them will go as far as dying while they are having that extra child, talking of the high risk, because they still want to achieve that status of being the mother of so-and-so. Many people look at uh, the developing countries and think that, oh, these people, they are so backward. They don't have strategies, they don't have anything. Everywhere you go, it is high maternal mortality. And yet, we have very many strategies, some of them extremely good, as I'll show you. But we have also so many challenges that we cannot quite achieve these strategies. So I want to take home the fact that it's not that we don't want to improve maternal mortality. We have strategies, but we have very many challenges that come uh, follow us wherever we go. I want you to look at a little bit about what Kenya is. We have a population of about 39.4 million, and almost a half is under 15. So you can imagine economically how much that half of uh, less than half, more than less, almost a half, contributes to the economy of that nation, their dependents. And then you look at the people who, the antenatal care attendants. At least 92% will attend the antenatal care once. But sad to say, they only go probably in the third trimester. So Dr. Monique was talking to us about all those high risks and the interventions. If somebody comes in the third trimester, what intervention are you going to do? She probably comes when she's fitting. 
and you can, don't even have enough time to educate her or to do any, uh, any care on her so that she can improve. When you look at that, uh, the second point, at least 53% attend the four times. I'll show you our antenatal, what you call focus antenatal care. We say the woman should at least visit the doctor at least four times, and only about a half do that. The majority will do probably once, then another lot, two, another three, and so we, we, the, we, we are not able to look after them properly. And then look at that. The people who are delivered by professional people, by skilled people, are only about 44%. And most of those are delivered by midwives. And yet, the others will be delivered by traditional birth attendants. Others will deliver themselves, or just another woman in the streets, or in the village. Uh, for many years, we, we had thought that if we trained these traditional birth attendants, we might improve the outcomes. So we had a time when we had the trained traditional birth attendants. But when you look at the statistics, we found that these people have no skills. If you come for two weeks as a traditional person with no medical background, someone takes you through, tells you if she comes with swollen and legs, if she comes like uh, she looks, you look at her, she looks a bit pale, refer her to the hospital. That person has no medical knowledge. So her decision making is not going to be there. Uh, when they know that the health systems are not very good, she'd rather, the woman had rather still stick to her traditional midwife, who is going to give her a cup of tea after she has delivered, compared to the absent healthcare provider whom she would have gone to. So you find that the, the, the women will still be delivered there uh, by the traditional person. If you look at the Caesarean section late, this is nationally, you'll find that again, the, many of them don't reach the services where they can have a Caesarean section. But I'll show you the, the, the strategy now we are having of taking the primary health care to, the, to, to, to where the women are so that we can have skilled bad attendants around to deliver them. And although many women deliver at home, 60, 66%, only 10% will go back for presidential care in the clinic. And many of us know that within 48 hours, quite a lot of maternal deaths occur. So you find that these women, again, are at a higher risk and they stay at home. Our maternal mortality is still quite high, 48. The previous one was 414. So instead of going down, and we are thinking of the marine development goals, we are actually going down. And this way we are being very aggressive in trying to see whether we can come up. Uh, we still have a problem of neonatal tetanus, and so we have now in our focus at uh, antenatal care, we have the whole idea of giving uh, tetanus toxoid. This is a map that most of us have interacted with, uh, and this is, that is Kenya. Looks like a small country there. That is Lake Victoria, and uh, you can see, if you look, this is, map is a little bit old, uh, but you can see where we, we are. We are people who still have a high mortality, maternal mortality. And if you look at this I took from the countdown, on the, on the countdown for Millennium Development Goals, you can still see that most of the causes of maternal mortality are really preventable. And we have just been taken through an excellent lecture on what happens when these patients come to us. So what we have is not that we cannot prevent these things, but we need to get these people, make a decision, go there, and have their problem solved. So let's go through the, the delays, the three delays. You people have no three delays, but we have them. So when you look at the three delays, the first one is on the woman, the woman, the community, uh, influence on her going to get care. Most of the women have no, no knowledge that you need to go for antenatal care. Their grandmother delivered at home, they did need antenatal care. Their neighbors deliver at home, so why go to the clinic? Others have cultural practices where everybody knows how to deliver their women, so you don't have to go for health care services. The other is religious beliefs. We still have people who believe that they don't go for, uh, for health care services. 
that you just pray for the person and pray for them and you don't take them. Some of them are being charged in court by the government for not taking their women or their children to hospital. But cultural practices also uh, make the woman not be able to go and look for care. And one of the religious beliefs, and one of the cultural practices which I forgot is the woman's decision making. In most cases, most women uh, have to wait upon the husband to give them the, the money to go to the clinic and the permission to go to the clinic. So if the man is not around and he has sent, not sent any money, that woman is not going to go to the, to the clinic. The others have a, a, a mother-in-law who is in charge, who says you've got to go to the clinic. I mean, if you are not going to look after the goods, look after the, the, the piece of land, because you're going to the clinic, you're wasting a lot of time, you know, being very productive. So those subcultural practices sometimes make the woman not go. And of course, the lack of empowerment. That woman, many of them don't have any resources that they can call their own. Even if they work so hard in the piece of land, they grow coffee, they grow tea, they grow bananas, those ones, they are still in the pockets of the head of home. And the head of the home has to decide what should be done with the money, even if he drinks most of it. So you find that that lack of empowerment, whether it is economic or whether it is educational, that makes the woman still at a disadvantage. And therefore, she will not be able to make that decision, and even if she does, she may not even be able to leave her house uh, to go for care. The second delay is the, the, the reaching the, the, the health care service. She may make the decision, but if the husband is not there to give her money to go to the clinic, how does she reach there? She has no transport. She may have the transport, but you don't have good roads or, or the vehicle that goes in the morning has just passed. She's got to wait for the next one to come tomorrow morning or in the evening. You know, PPH is not going to wait for her to wait for the next vehicle. The only option she has is to die. You get my point? So it may be beyond her to be able to go. And then the third one is a delay in receiving uh, care. She may still land in that health care service, uh, care institution. But again, she may not have the service that she had in, intended to have. Because suppose she gets to a place where we don't have uh, someone to receive her and work for her. There are places where you may have maybe one or two nurses working in a health center 24 hours a day. So they normally would work from morning until evening. And you know most babies are made at night. So they come at night. And this lady will not find anybody in the health institution. So what does she do? She's got to deliver at home or wait until morning. Others, they may have a problem of the, 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 the people who are the care providers are not well skilled to deal with a big emergency. So again, to try to transfer her from there to the next level, it may take a long time because that institution may not even have transport to take her. She may be told, go and look for somebody in your village to hire a vehicle to take her to the clinic. And suppose it's a rainy day and the vehicles cannot reach. She won't reach the next level and therefore she won't get that health care because where she was, she had a problem. And of course, lack of materials. You people may not understand what it means to go to a hospital and you are told we don't have gloves, examination gloves, or you don't have uh, sutures, you don't have an anesthetist. So you can't do a cesarean section, transfer to the next hospital. We're talking about an emergency, not an elective procedure. And then of course, all the weak healthcare systems which are there, the, the woman is a big disadvantage. And if you look at this picture now, about the skilled health workers, you can see that Kenya, which was somewhere there, is one of the countries that have got critical shortage of healthcare services, providers. And I'd like you to look at that picture. Look at the blue one. And look at the orange one. It's a mirror image. That where you have hardly any healthcare skilled uh, birth attendants a delivery, you still have a high mortality. So what we need to do is to make sure that our systems are working and we have healthcare providers who are working. If we are going to tackle the maternal health, 
in a country, in a rural resource country. Maybe we can have a look at some of the problems that we have with the human resources, no, with, the, with the countries. <clears throat> financial, uh, financial. We are in chronic shortage of money. I know you also are. But when we have a smaller budget and we have a so smaller income, you find that the budgetary allocation for health care cannot be anywhere near what is supposed to be uh, significant for any nation. We have a problem of human resource. I'll talk about it a little bit later. And then poor health ma management systems. We have poverty and ignorance. Most of our people have no social security or health insurance. So even if they get to that hospital, if a bill is produced, they will not be able to pay. And they're going to look for friends and ask them, can you help us to pay? Or can you sell your cow or your goat if you have one? Or do something. And if you are particularly in the poor urban areas where you don't even have a piece of land, then you are in a lot of trouble. Uh, we look at cultural barriers. I, I thought I'd mention that, that one specifically. This is female genital mutilation, or what you call female genital cut, uh, where they, they, they do culturally to try and it's a, it's a rite of passage method for quite a lot of the, the tribes, where you, the woman is, they cut the clitoris, some of them go to the labia majora, and to make sure that this woman is, a, this girl is going to be quite an adult, respond sexually proper after marriage and it gives us a lot of problem in terms of uh, even delivery of that baby some of them you got to give a double episiotomy and if she doesn't reach your hospital then she'll be tearing up everything when she's at home delivering i talked a little bit about religious barriers and i talked about uh, uh, infrastructure let's start off with the with the human resource problem and these are some of the resources, these documents are what we have put up for our country to find out how we can solve this problem. We have shortages of staff. Shortages is an understatement. As I said earlier, uh, you may find that you have only about two or three people working in a health center where most of the people are. And, uh, and their distribution is also a big problem because some places are very remote. And people want to be closer to the towns where their spouses are and where their families are. And you find people keep on resigning because they don't want to be taken to where uh, those remote areas. And those remote areas don't even have good housing. And you may have to walk a long distance to reach the health center if you're going to have adequate place. So we have a lot of problems with the health workers. I call this um, a migration brain drain and brain circulation. The drain is what is happening. You have a lot of medical people whom we have trained with our poor resources, and they are very well skilled. But they all seem to be given a, a, a carrot of better payments. So they are all going to the West. That's the brain drain. So we keep on removing them, getting new ones who have very little experience, and as soon as they get free experience, they go away. So we are like a feeding trough for those of you who are farmers. You have a cow where you feed them and they go and rest somewhere else. So, and that doesn't help us because we still have, we need someone who has the skills and experience to be able to do a good job. I mean, you can't come out from an asking school today and be able to cope with an eclamptic patient. You need to know how to nurse the patient. You can't come out of the medical school as a young doctor and be able to cope with a severe PPH for example. So we have that one happening. The brain circulation, you may be wondering, it's not blood. It is where you have staff coming from one institution to another within the country, or they're doing very well in the Ministry of Health where they have laying up policies and an NGO system and gives them good money. So they move out. That decision-making person, that policy person has gone. Or you find them going from the public institution because their salaries are smaller and they are going to the private institutions. And so you keep on having shortages which people are around but yet not around. And then because of shortage of uh, finances, you still have some people who are trained and they are at home because they can't get jobs. Isn't it a contradiction? 
you have people at home whom you could be using, but because you have no money to pay them, they are at home. And the uh, healthcare management, human management systems, uh, leadership and resource management. You know, you may find <clears throat> somebody who has been put in charge of a hospital is a doctor, but she hasn't gone through the training of how to manage a hospital. But she's the person who is available. So they are meant to be the ones who are going to do the human resources, deal with procurement, deal with everything, and yet they don't have the training. Information system and the weaknesses in pre- and post-service training. This is a very, very important factor. Because if you're going to have, for example, maternal care, emergency obstetrical training, you may find that some people have not had any training since they graduated and since they are working in a small hospital for the last 30 years. How do they know what is the latest way of managing a shoulder dystocia? When do they even know how do you manage PPH? How do they know that you don't now you are not going to do active management of that stage by clamping the cord quickly? You need to delay the, 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 the clamping of the cord. They have no idea. So you have a problem of post-service training. Pre-service, again, the new curriculums need to be injected with the latest materials of what, how do you manage obstetric care. Uh, right now, we are trying to, to come up with a national emergency obstetrical and gynecological uh, curriculum. And we hope that it will just kind of harmonize everything and that we'll be able to teach everybody on how to manage our health cares. And then this is another thing. You know, these people are working hard, almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And yet when they go home, the pay pack is very small. So they find they can't even educate their children. Right now, as I stand, I left people in my country the day before yesterday. The doctors were on strike. The junior doctors were on strike. And I said, oh, I hope the consultants don't go on strike, because they've worked for a whole week doing the work of a junior doctor, so before too long, they're going to assemble together and say, enough is enough. That's what I mean. But again, when you go to the rural areas and you have a word, D, a letters DR in front of your name, you're supposed to be in a particular status. So everybody expects you to be driving a good car. Everybody expects if they have no school children for their children, school fees for their children, you are asked to give them some. If they're putting up a church or a school and there is a fundraising, they expect you to give a big pay pack. The society has put you in a particular position. And yet, because of the compensation and the salaries, you really can't. So this worked of a worked person says, I'm going to go to my employer. Pay me and my allowances. And if you don't, I put down my tools. But when two bulls are fighting, who suffers? The ground. So the patients are suffering. And uh, I talked a bit about women empowerment. Women work so hard and yet they don't have the rights of most of the things that economically would help them to go on. Many of them don't even have bank accounts and they wait for their husband to give them a bit of money. Then there is the whole issue of male involvement. I think for the years we have concentrated so much on the woman. She comes to the Antinto clinic, we tell her everything and she's, you trust that she's going to translate that material and give it to her husband the way you presented it. And the man has no idea. So it's for him to decide whether to listen or not, and he still makes up the decision. And then we have HIV burden, which is also complicating the whole issue of maternal health. Then I thought we'll look at other things that are beyond us, and these are the natural, natural disasters. You can look at the droughts the effects of floods, the effect of famine. None of those is going to help the woman's health at all. Look at that. That's supposed to be a road. Can you see the road? I mean, you can't see the tarmac. You can't see where you're supposed to be driving. Even walking is a problem on it. Now, imagine if that vehicle was trying to take a patient who had just delivered and is having PPH or is fitting from eclampsia, and you're rushing her to a hospital. Would she ever reach there? And this, this is just next, last week. It's not many years ago. So you can see that kind of thing uh, with the infrastructure. This is another road. This I took the day before. 
But you can see this one. This road takes a vehicle for that section of a road takes about three hours. Right now, vehicles are taking 12 hours. How would you be able to take a woman to hospital and expect her to have her blood test taken for liver function tells? Help syndrome would have killed her. She would have bled to death before she reaches there. Look at some other women. That lady is carrying a jerry can only 20 liters of water. I should probably travel for about 20 kilometers to get 20 liters. That water will be used for cooking, for bathing, for feeding the animals, for washing, and for everything. And she could easily be pregnant. And after that, she's expected to go and look for food and cook it and serve it. How would you, unless you bring this water to where she is, how would you improve her maternal health? Drought. Right now, we have some areas which have no, water, no rain. And um, in fact, we have another problem right now, where large, uh, in many provinces, the, the, the production of maize is going to go down because there's a viral infection or something which has dried up most of the maize before it has grown, brought the food. So again, if you have no food security, that woman is not going to feed. The little food she has, she'll give it to her husband and the children. And she will not eat anything. But she hopes tomorrow there will be more and she can eat the little one for tomorrow. And she could be pregnant. What about man-made disasters? The man-made disasters, I'm calling them political instability. Thank God our country hasn't had coups, but we had one attempted one in 1981. 82, that's 30 years ago. We're still praying that nothing happens. But you find in most of those rural resource countries, particularly in Africa, there are changes of the government every time they have coups and counter coups and everything. During that time, how can a woman be able to access health care? She can't. Governance. Policies that are going to be made by a bad governance, allocation of funds, health care systems, they can't help. And this is, we enjoy quite a lot. Wars. You may be at peace within, but you may be fighting without. Right now, our country, as you have read, has been fighting with our neighbor called Somalia. And a lot of our money has been pumped into that country. So again, you cannot go and say, we need drugs. We need our, our, our health care systems improved. Ethnic fighting. Sometimes they just fight over a cow or a goat. Two weeks ago, some people woke up, they had an ethnic fight, and we had a rude shock. Over about 50 women and children were killed in cold blood. Just because one tribe is fighting another tribe. Now you can imagine the rest of the people ran away from that village. And where did they go? Out in the cold. What will happen to that lady who will get into labor? Not under any shelter. And she's so scared of being killed, she wouldn't even get out of the hole she's, the place, place she's hiding in a bush. You're talking about my health, maternal health care. It's beyond her. It's beyond other people. And then, of course, corruption. I know there's corruption over the world, but it's also in our country. You know where there are people, are, it's about me, myself, and I. What am I getting out of this position I'm in? Not the salary, but something more. And that complicates the issues. So what the country has done is come up with a national reproductive health policy. And the, the main idea is to enhance reproductive health status for all, whether they are in a, in, Canada, in a refugee camp or whether they are in a village, to give it to everybody. Talking about refugees, we have a lot of refugees from the neighboring countries. I've had the privilege of teaching emergency obstetric care in one of the refugee camps last year. And I tell you, we discovered that for every patient who had eclampsia and who landed in that hospital, died. Every one of them, it's called Kakuma refugee camp. Six of them had died before we arrived, within about two months. On the, on the day after we arrived, a seventh one died. Until I stopped the training and I said, can we sit down and look at this file and critically see where the gaps are? and we taught uh, them what to do. On the way back, while we were picking the flight, 
we got a message, another eclamptic patient has arrived. And of course we gave the, the advice on what should be done. By the time we got to Nairobi, she had died. Eight patients dying from eclampsia, the same institution, in about four months. Dr. Monique, you need to go there. But you got to take the whole of the resources of America to improve the services. Equitable. And again, this is very difficult to say. Some, some areas have got med better services than the others. It's supposed to be efficient. I have talked about all the challenges. By the time we undo all those human resources and everything, to get it efficient is going to take us time. And we need us, uh, an effective service delivery. That is our hope and that's our policy in the government. And then you look at what programs we, are, we have in the country, productive health programs. We want them to be consistent with the Kenyan culture. So that we want to look at the good parts of the culture which are good and now introduce them as we do our systems. Because if you are fighting a cultural practice, you are not going to get anywhere. Like the female genital mutilation, instead of having to tell them, stop this barbaric culture, you bring in a new rite of passage. Why you take the girls and teach them about moving from a girl to a woman in a different way. That's happening now. And uh, so you don't have to cut her, but you can sharpen her mind. So that's what we call about cultural needs. And then we want to look at the specific needs of that particular area. And Kenya's, what this is important, in our healthy policy, it looks like to reduce our unwanted pregnancy, they want abstinence for the youth. That means that you're going to get a lot of programs which you're going to take to the young people and encourage the unmarried to, uh, to, to abstain. And uh, then, of course, I talked about focus antenatal care, and we want everybody to be delivered by a skilled health provider. These are some of the things that we are looking at. Security of reproductive commodities. You don't want everybody to just bombard the country with drugs which are not good enough for them. So somebody is there to make sure that what you are giving is good. Prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. We have programs all over the country giving prophylaxis and treatment. Emergency obstetric and neonatal care. As I said, we have very many programs that are going now. We want to come up with an, uh, one. Uh, addressing of reproductive health issues for the adolescents. Again, we have a lot of uh, teenage pregnancies like other people. And reproductive health persons with disabilities, are we taking care of them? You know, the mentally challenged, the ones who are physically challenged, we also have a policy for them. And then we have another issue of gender-based violence. The rape cases, the women who are battered by their husband, and integration of reproductive health and HIV care. Because we find if you have too many clinics, the woman will not come today for HIV, go for reproductive health tomorrow, go to the child health tomorrow. So we are thinking of integrating this together so that she leaves home one day and covers everything. And then improving the maternal health in terms of the food, nutrition, and things like that, and gender equality and all that. So you can see that we have policies, and they are good policies. Um, that's a rep repetition, sorry. And then I thought uh, I would now tell you what we have done in terms of uh, the new, we have a new constitution, which is trying to make sure that everybody gets those policies and strategies right. Before we had the six levels, but one has to go to the third level before you could be able to get a good uh, healthcare uh, institution that would be able to do caesarean section, blood transfusion, and all that. So this is a new system where the one is the community. And at the community, we got the community health educators. We got them choose. We also have community uh, health extension workers. And they'll be mobilizing the community to know what is the importance of antenatal care, postnatal care, delivery, and all that. And then from the community, they go to a two, level two, which is a primary health care. This is where now we hope there will be services for delivery, including caesarean section, just next to the people. And then from there, we have the secondary health care. By then, they start in, including uh, respiratory medicine, uh, phys uh, physicians who go there for general medicine, surgical. And then you go to the tertiary. This one will now be covering the whole of that uh, uh, county area, it's a referral. And then we have what you call the National Referral Hospital, where you have people can be sent into that. At the moment, we have only two. Now we're going to have 15. 
so there'll be uh, equal distribution according to the counties. And now what is the two national hospitals, we are going to tag them into university teaching hospitals, where again, they'll be, they'll be at the university and for education. So we have a lot of changes that we are bringing around. And uh, these are basically what we are giving in our focus. We call it FUNC. Uh, and you can see it is at least four care, four antenatal visits, uh, prevention for malaria, tetanus oxide, and encourage the women to sleep, and the children to sleep under mosquito nets and the supplements for nutrition. And then we, we just in 2010, we, 2010, we had uh, a new constitution. And in that, there was devolution of power. So that now, instead of everything being done in the central government, it has gone now into the county level. So we'll be having budgets at the counties. Before we had provinces which were eight, now we have 47 counties, meaning that you can get care and, uh, and budgets for each of them. The next one is the right to life. Our constitution says that everybody has a right to life, and that life starts at conception. So you can see maternal health is going to be taken broadly from that because it is in the constitution. Right to health care service, uh, I'll read that one for you. So this is the map of Kenya with the 47 counties. So you can imagine this was divided into eight before. Now it is divided into 47 administrative counties with a governor. Of course, that means now a lot of resources to set up the offices and budgets and all. But I think we're getting somewhere. Uh, I thought I'll read this one because we are talking about health, maternal health. And our constitution says, every person has the right to the highest attainable standard of health, which includes the right to health care services, including reproductive health care. So whatever we do, that woman has a right. And we have to make sure that we put up policies that are going to be within our constitution. And then somebody in the introduction talks about uh, rejecting pregnant girls. Uh, this is a program we have started, which is called uh, Akiota. You may have seen it in your program. Uh, these are rescue homes for girls who are pregnant and they are rejected by guardians and family, by church, by schools. We take them together. Uh, we give them accommodation. We give them counseling. We give them antenatal care. And we actually are special sponsors for National Hospital Insurance Scheme so that they, they, they are given what we call a maternity package. And we give only less than one and a half dollar, uh, uh, euro per month. You pay for her less than one euro, one and a half euro per month. And then when they come to, the, to delivery, all they do is to issue a card. And we think those girls would be helped with that program. This program is a community based, it is affordable, it is replicable, and it's acceptable, both religiously and culturally and is being established and run by churches. And then the, our country has got another program which is called Economic Growth Recovery for Employment and Wealth Creation. We have projects and policies and everything. So that again is to restore the economic growth within the text of sustainable framework and strengthen institutions of governance, restore and expand infrastructure capital and invest in human. Again, our government will be trying to do that to make sure that we improve. And a lot of money has been pumped into agriculture, you can see, so that you can have food security. Uh, this one, I thought I'd bring it, it was something which came up in the news and I was very happy about it. We have part of that northeastern side of the country is a very dry land. Most of this area is very dry. And the people who stay there are mainly pastoralists. And this is why we're going to have a project of worth 20 billion shillings being taken there so that with the help of the Israeli government, we shall be able to do irrigation and improve food security. Don't you think that is nice? Yeah, for our mothers, they'll be able to have food. And again, construction industry has improved and a lot has grown. And then we have free primary education. Again, you find that if a woman has never been to school, it will be very difficult for her to even understand what you're talking about antenatal care, safe delivery, hygiene, and all that. But now we want everybody to get the basic eight years of education. So we have what we have, the primary health care, our primary education care. Again, it has its own challenges, but it's already affected with the new government. Um, now, can you compare that road to the original one? This is, uh, we've, uh, again, by our government going to the east, where 
labor and money is a bit cheaper. It's been possible to put up highways so that quite a lot of roads have now been improved, except for the real small roads in the rural areas, so that people can be able to take their produce to the market, they can go to the hospital, they can go to antenatal care, children can be taken to school. So we are now improving the infrastructure. And you should come to Kenya and actually enjoy the road. And again, a lot of money has been put into health. That's a child who is being given a polio vaccination. And you can see the country has uh, uh, allocated about 85 billion to improve the healthcare facilities. What has happened before is that we also have what you call constituency development fund, money which would be given to every constituency. And the constituency is made to administer that fund so that you improve. And a lot of health centers have been built with the, with the community initiative using that money. Again, people being able to reach health care services through that work. Uh, one of the problems we have is, of course, no accurate care records. We talk about high maternal mortality, but who knows how many people died and they were not documented? Because we have cultures where you die in the morning and if it's before noon, you are buried. Or nobody recorded, uh, did you, did she, was she pregnant? Did she have uh, an ectopic? Uh, did she die of malaria? Did she die of a ruptured uterus? Nobody knows the documents. And of course, misdiagnosis. And then uh, people don't want to be known that they die giving birth, so there's a stigma. stigma. And uh, where people are scattered in the community, it's very difficult to be able to get the data from them. And of course, there are some communities which don't take a maternal death to be anything serious. It's like the woman has gone on a journey. She may or she may not come back. If she comes back, it will be okay. If she doesn't come back, we thought she was not going to come back. Uh, and I think for a mother who has got so much uh, uh, responsibility, it's our responsibility to do that. So what am I saying in a nutshell? If you are going to deal with a maternal health in a poor resource country, you've got to use a multifaceted approach. You've got to look at the education of the woman, you've got to look at the political stability, you've got to look at the economic issues, you've got to look at the healthcare systems, you've got to look at the human resource, and all those when they are added together, you'll be able to come up with a strategy which will improve the maternal health of that particular area. And we believe that everything is possible. And it was Nelson Mandela the former president uh, of the year, Nelson Mandela, who said, it always feels impossible until it is done. And that is what we believe. It may look very dark, it may look impossible, but we know it is going to happen. Thank you for listening. God bless you.